Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Shout out to APJC for all of you that have joined. Thank you. My name is Molly Das, and my pronouns are she, her. And along with my co-host, Mark Murphy, we are the outgoing global co-leads for Cisco Pride. I want to extend a warm welcome to our Cisco LGBTQ plus and ally family from all over the world, as well as those joining via YouTube. And for the first time ever, we are streaming live via Cisco.com. This is our ninth year broadcasting live, and this is actually our third year broadcasting live and having an APJC specific event. We started out three years ago in Bangalore, India, when um, Amendment 377 was repealed, and we've been carrying on ever since. We're so grateful for it. We're so honored to be here with you today, which is a result of a lot of hard work from across Cisco, all driving an inclusive future, and it really does take a village, y'all. I mentioned earlier that Mark and I are the outgoing global co-leads for Cisco Pride, and later on in the broadcast, you'll get to hear from one of our upcoming incoming global co-leads, Zilma Lang, along with Jennifer Rideout, the both of them will take over the baton, and it's just time for us to step aside and let these two new amazing leaders uh, take our community to new heights, and we're so excited and grateful for it. And over the past two years, it's been my personal privilege to serve this Cisco Pride community. And I'll just have to say, wow, this community gets stuff done. I'm so proud of some of the accomplishments that we've been able to build. And I just want to share a couple of examples with you. For instance, in terms of building community, one of the things that Mark and I set out to do was double the membership of Cisco Pride overall globally. We also wanted to acknowledge that we have diversity within our organization. So we created safe spaces such as transitioning safe spaces, as well as the parent ally group, leadership, leadership cohorts, and so on. And we had a specific focus on making sure that we're extending our reach to be more inclusive and aware of the needs of our APJC community. And we're so glad that you know we're we're here all together today and that we're able to actually have a specific event that works with your time zone that works with you know your morning and not everybody else's in addition we wanted to make sure that we're celebrating the spirit that we always embody in terms of giving back and for that we accelerated a lot of lgbtq plus charities to be matched for cisco donations and we created a LGBTQ plus bright fund uh, fund uh, for Cisco employees to donate towards. And then last but not least, and this is something that's super close to my heart, we created an allyship training program that's available to all Cisco employees by a degree so that we can all grow, grow in our uh, allyship together, as well as pick and choose the types of learning that we find might be more important to us or might be more relevant based on where we are and how we grew up. And no doubt all of these efforts are interconnected and our hope is that all of this collective work creates more space for our voices and our experiences to be shared. So that way we can bring our whole selves to work and we can actually be authentic leaders in the workplace, which is actually a key theme for today and we're so excited for that. Before we move forward, I just wanna share a couple of housekeeping items. For those of you logged in via Cisco TV chat, uh, please actually share your uh, messages through chat, share your questions through the Q&A panel, participate in those polls. Again, that's Cisco TV specific. For those of you watching via YouTube, please feel free to use the messaging platform within. And for anyone who wants to share this on social platforms, remember hashtag Cisco Pride and hashtag we are Cisco. And Mark, I'd love to hand it over to you to introduce the rest of our program. Hello, Molly, and thank you so very much uh, for everyone. My name is Mark Murphy, and my pronouns are he, him. This year is thankfully different from last year, as there are bright spots in front of us, thanks to COVID-19 vaccines being administered around the world. However, keeping it very real, the pandemic continues to ravage many parts of your region and the APJC space, including India, Brazil, other parts of the world are still struggling. So if Molly and I may take a bit of personal privilege, we ask everyone to please send healing thoughts to those previously and still being impacted by the COVID-19 virus. This past year challenged many of us, as I said, 
nearly every one of us worked from home. Many of us simultaneously looked after ones and educated our children. Many of us were also isolated for weeks or even months on end. And yet others had to go back into the closet because they were living in unsafe spaces. At Cisco, we are talking about burnout, and it's no wonder people are feeling this way. For our leaders, we're having conversations and, and recognizing that burnout shows up in many different ways. And it's important for us to have our antenna up, not only for ourselves, but also for others and our teammates and our colleagues. Some things that we're asking people to pay attention to. Be real. Be honest. Set boundaries. And for your team, have a conversation about how best you can support them. How best would they like to be rewarded? Do things in the immediate, especially with all of us being so virtual. We wanted to take this opportunity today to have a conversation about professional development and success as a way to take care of ourselves. We are looking to insert energy back into our lives and to focus on ourselves and our professional development. We should all thrive at work, not just simply survive it. Molly and I set forward a plan to focus on additional time and energy on professional development as a key pillar for Cisco Pride. Building on the foundation of our Cisco Proud Mentoring Program, we put together two cohorts of out LGBTQ plus colleagues. Taking our cue from the Connected Black Professionals Inclusive Community, we wanted to encourage our out LGBTQ plus employees to have a safe space where we can just encourage conversations to discuss topics around their career, career growth, including sponsorship, mentorship, advocacy, and even how does someone become a vice president? Which gets us to today's event. Regardless of who we are, if we can't see ourselves in the mirror of leaders at executive levels, advancing in our career feels limited and possibly unlikely, living as our true selves. As our LGBTQ plus community knows, we have a much more complex relationship in this regard because simply looking in the mirror doesn't always reflect back someone who looks like me. We have to take the extraordinary step sometimes to live as our true selves in declaring our LGBTQ plus identity. One final note, as I too step down as the global co-lead of Cisco Pride, I wanna share a couple things. One, uh, for the APJC audience, I am so thrilled that we started this journey three years ago. Last year, April, I was to have been at Tokyo Rainbow Pride. We were talking about uh, being with you all in Australia uh, this year and other parts of the region. We'll get there, and I look forward to seeing you. But my final words, I send you all my love. I do. My well wishes, and most importantly for me, my passion to continue the work to power an inclusive future for all globally. With that, here's what we have in store for you today. We will first hear from our executive sponsor. We have two extraordinary external guests, our executive leadership team sponsor and a wonderful Cisco panel today. With one minor change, Molly is standing in for Jeff Campbell, who is making great things happen in our Washington DC office with our CEO, Chuck Robbins. So let's get started. I am so pleased to introduce our Cisco Pride executive sponsor, Brian Maddox. Brian, over to you. Hey, thanks, Mark. And uh, I'm just trying to think how I'm going to ad hoc this one uh, for this evening. And uh, welcome uh, and good morning to all of you within APJC. And um, Mark, Molly, uh, I'm going to personally miss you. Uh, but you know what? Maybe next year we bring you back in as guests in some sort of format because we got to one up what you guys are about to see today. So it's a uh, uh, I, I will tell you what, I had a really hard time working the rest of the day after I went through this conversation. So I hope that you guys find it as fruitful and as energetic as I did. Um, the way in which we kind of look through the lens of pride, at least over the last several years, and I've been a part of pride for the last probably five or six years inside the company, is really around three different pillars. And we've kind of touched on a few of them. One of them is really around the communities where we just talk about you know, things that we might be doing within our local chapter, things that we're doing regionally. Uh, we might have global events such as this, 
And that's a great forum for us just to collaborate and come together and, and have conversations, hard conversations, easy conversations, and so forth. Um, the second pillar is really around that professional development. And I think uh, Molly and, and Mark have done a phenomenal job over the last three years. Uh, everything from our early in career and how we're thinking about hiring all the way through to you know, first line managers coming in and getting that opportunity to get mentors and sponsorships and that type of stuff. And, and I hope we continue that journey. And then the last one is really around allyship, which I'm also personally uh, heavily weighted towards. And, and I think, you know, from, from my perspective, all of us are born uh, without blinders, but somehow through our journeys in life, we create these different points of views and blinders. And in a lot of cases, if we can get proximate uh, with inclusion and diversity and different types of minorities or ethnic backgrounds or sexual orientation or whatever that might be, uh, we start to realize those differences are actually create more power and uh, and the uniqueness of all of this is actually what's uh, which is what's so great. And so when I think about allyship, it's really around our teams uh, having an opportunity to lean into the experience and understand pride and some of the other inclusion and diversity efforts we have. And then from that, my hope and my desire would be that that goes back out into the communities, whether or not those communities are your customers or your partners or the communities that you live within. Um, and I would like to see all three, and then obviously that expands globally. And then maybe the last thing before I send it over to our distinguished guest is, uh, Mark, you know, I, I am going to miss uh, that very first meeting we had in San Jose in Building 9. And then I also remember the, this wonderful event that we did three years ago where you were standing on stage in Bangalore with so many of our friends. And uh, and in my heart and, and, and my prayers go out to all of you guys uh, and in that area of the world right now. And um, it was just a phenomenal event to see yourself and your partner get to participate in that in Bangalore. So our distinguished guest, uh, without further ado, is Kara Schwisser. Um, I can't believe Mark actually got her to get uh, to get on stage with us and help moderate this panel around professional development. Uh, she's very distinguished in so many different ways. Not only is uh, she's uh, part of the <clears throat> Editor, editor at large at the New York Media. Uh, she has the podcast Pivot, podcast Sway. Uh, she's interviewed Bill Gates. Uh, you you name it, Steve Jobs. I mean, she's been there. She's done it, right? And she's been inside of the tech for for a very very long time. And if that's not enough, she's also writing another book on the internet and digital the digital era that we live within. And so with that, I would love to turn it over to Kara, and we will uh, start the moderator panel. Um, so my pronouns, if it's Silicon Valley people talking, it's either jerk or savior. So uh, people have an attitude about me um, in Silicon Valley, uh, not VCs. I would be jerk, probably tech workers, savior. Anyway, um, I, it's actually uh, she, her. Um, so I, I, they asked me to come here to talk about my background. I'm going to read you what they said. Her story and background, why visible leadership in tech is important. Observations of great leadership in our community, what she has seen evolve over the years. Kara's call to action. I don't really have a call to action, but I'm going to start uh, with that one actually, um, because I really do think as many um, as I look across, you know, diversity issues and what's going on right now uh, with especially related to uh, LGBTQ uh, issues, it's really uh, been a, uh, been actually quite disheartening over the last year watching all these anti-trans bills work their way through state legislatures across the country. Um, it's just the latest attack of, uh, of, of uh, it's mostly the GOP, it is, it is the GOP, um, across um, across state legislatures, which is, makes it very dangerous. And it reminds me a great deal of the marriage fight that went on many years ago, which we all take for granted now. But at the time, since I'm a super old person, it wasn't at all possible to get married and it was very difficult to be gay. Um, I'm not going to sort of bore you with that, like what how difficult it was to be gay, because, you know, we all we all came out better uh, for that fight uh, in the end. Um, but right now, what's happening is really, again, the same kind of stuff that happened many years ago with the bathroom bills and before that with gay marriage and other rights. And so we have to keep in mind as we're watching this uh, unfold that it's the, the, the threats still exist across the country and across the world, especially I think Hungary just passed uh, another anti-gay law today. Um, obviously, in countries across the world, there's a lot of mo most of the movement is towards anti 
uh, LGBTQ uh, plus uh, issues um, and not on the because we've taken it so for granted. So my call to action is to not think that we have any kind of um, status that is permanent, um, no matter how many um, marriages we have, no matter how many children we have. Um, but at the same time, I really believe uh, quite a lot in in forward momentum of this. Um, I sort of I'll give my background a little bit, um, but I, the way I believe it is that I keep having children. Um, and I keep uh, I keep getting married and I keep having children. Um, so I got, I've only been married twice. So I'm, it's not like I'm some people, um, but um, I, I am uh, I'm uh, I have a lot of children and, and I keep having them because I really do believe in gay family in families. Um, and I also believe in uh, gays and lesbians being prominent and present um, in ways that are example setting and. Uh, largely, I'm growing an army that I call Militia Etheridge, um, and so uh, in, in, when I need that, they will be here, all my children. That is a joke for people who don't are not allowed to joke on the Internet anymore. Um, maybe. Uh, in any case, um, I, um, I, I started off in journalism, and I was already out when I was in journalism. Media was a really good place to be out. It wasn't something that was that you that you got you suffered for necessarily and in fact um it was it was it was actually a help in many in some ways in a lot of ways um and so i've never i, I experienced most of my being uh, closeted when i was younger uh but it wasn't particular it wasn't i wasn't particularly old uh old when i came out it was in my uh teens um and it was a difficult journey at the time because it was there were so many family issues it were mostly the the big things uh, i had faced um, and I worked in media and mostly covered things that were not uh, uh, related to the subject um, and began covering tech in about um, two, 1993 or 92 when I was covering AOL. And one of the things that I did like about covering tech was that it was also a place uh, where a lot of gays and lesbians first were able to reach out to each other in settings that were less dangerous. Although some say, might say some of the stuff going on is quite dangerous. You say some of the rhetoric and it is. Um, but at the time, it was really hard to reach out to people to meet people. It was much more furtive, um, and the web and the internet provided uh, a way for people to 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 find each other in ways that never existed before, and was a real boon uh, to uh, gays and lesbians. It's one of the things I liked about it. Um, one of the early companies I covered was in Washington, which Cisco knows well, uh, AOL. Um, actually, I covered Cisco when there was the outage and stuff. That was 150 years ago, but. Um, uh, that's when I first ran into Cisco because it was making all the routers and things like that. Um, but one of the things that was uh, was really interesting was that they were embracing the companies were embracing, especially AOL, their gay and lesbian um, uh, customers in terms of providing chat rooms and the ability to do so. They made investments in Planet Out um, and and places like that. Um, and it was really it was a really fascinating time because one of the things gays and lesbians were an integral part of the building of these uh, social media networks, um, not not Facebook of today, but the early, early days. And so they were very it was a very important group of people that were using it and were early adopters. And so I paid a lot of attention um, and in fact, ended up marrying the CEO of Planet Out, who later on went on to Google. But um, but one of the things uh, that. Um, that was critical as Steve Case uh, talked to, talk to me about was the idea of people reaching across geographies, reaching across uh, time zones, reaching across ability to, to, from isolation to reach out to each other. And he and, and gays and lesbians were one of the prime examples. He had two examples. One was gays and lesbians. The other were quilters, which was could have been a, there was a Venn diagram there somewhere where they belong together. In any case, um, he was always pointing them out. Um, as as groups that worked really well in the case of the quilters actually uh he had me come in to AOL because they all met, he brought he flew them all in in person and they had made a quilt a giant AOL quilt for him um but one of the things that was important to uh the company was to to be able to find groups and be able to meet and get on and obviously a lot of the early innovation in uh in communications uh, including dating was were gays and lesbians, and of course, Planet Out led the way, gay.com, um, and many others, before, way before a lot of the current dating apps and things like that. These were content sites. These were abilities to chat with people. It wasn't just dating, although that was certainly part of it. Um, and, and it was really heartening to see because it was so out, um, and as opposed to most people's lives at the time, which weren't. Um, one of the things that I remember my ex-wife saying was that um, she used to give speeches and she used to say, we have 63 members in Vatican City, uh, which was made me laugh all the time. 
um, because, but they had members everywhere in the world. That was her point. Um, but it was her favorite thing to say, which it made everybody laugh. It still makes me laugh. Um, anyway, um, so I continued to co cover the internet. And one of the things that you started to see was the weaponization of, of the internet tools uh, to hurt groups, marginalized groups like gays and lesbians. Um, and one, and you begin to just, just be, if you're allowed to have a tool, which was a tool for, for peop, uh, LGBTQ plus people, and it certainly was to be able to get out information, to be able to talk to each other, to be able to meet. It also became a weaponized tool because as Brad Smith from Microsoft says, something's a tool or a weapon. Um, it's any, any technology is a tool or a weapon. And in the case of uh, of the internet, it, it quickly became clear that some people were using it for weaponry in terms of hurting gays and lesbians, spreading false information, um, attacking, threatening, and things like that. So it just, just the things that had been a boon can also be something that's dangerous for people. And that's sort of where it shifted rather significantly in the coverage I did um, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of these issues and gays and lesbians were among the people I cover, but it was a lot of different marginalized groups. It was always the same thing, which was spreading false information, um, demonizing people, using these tools to, to recruit um, um, negativity and negative things and to recruit people into this, this way of thinking. Um, and it didn't, it wasn't just limited. It was, it was, it was all kinds of bad information about uh, AIDS issues, all kinds of information about lots of things about, um, um, I can't even remember what that, uh, you know, making people not gay anymore, that that group of crazy people. Um, and uh, and so one of the things I'll, I'll remember from several, several years ago, I was at YouTube and uh, I was talking to Susan Wojcicki, who was the, the, the uh, CEO of the company, and uh, she was talking about a real problem she had where they had a very anti-gay uh, uh, a person on YouTube spewing all sorts of crap, um, and they were trying to figure out how to shut it down if it crossed their lines. And they, you know, they were these people were not capable of debating massive social issues as you've seen. Um, they have they're not they don't have the skills necessary to deal with what they have wrought. Nonetheless, she was really concerned. She was asking me, "What I don't we don't know what to do because it's sometimes when it, we're waiting for him to cross the line, but he hasn't yet." And and then I was like, "What's the line?" And we were talking back and forth. And one thing this guy did when he realized he was in trouble and he ha was crossing a lot of their rules that they had put in place, which are enforced rather not well. I would say um, she um, she said what he did is he took his information and he made it into ads um, and then he sold them because it was an automated system. So his information became ads and then the ads went on gay and lesbian sites. And at one at first I was like, oh, that's clever, that awful human being that what a clever, awful human being. And she was like, well, it's really hard to stop that because it's in an automated system, but it started popping up on all kinds of you know, normal gay and lesbian sites, anti-gay advertising on gay and lesbian uh, positive sites. And so it was, I just didn't know what to say because I to, to be able to police this is really difficult and really hard. And I do have some sympathy for these companies at the same time, I've been quite critical of how lax they've been. Um, but it's, you know, again, it iterates not just among gays and lesbians, but others. So um, so at the same time, it was my life, you know, this was my life and I was having, you know, having kids and trying to raise them um, in the ways that, that they understand tolerance, they understand a lot of this information that comes across um, the internet is problematic and, 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 and continue to live our lives. Now, of course, we live in San Francisco, which makes it a lot easier, um, but, but trying to figure out ways to, to use technology and the power it brings to have positive imagery about our lives and everything else. And on the whole, it had been a very positive upward momentum. But again, you know, you kept seeing these kind of things happen over and over and over again. And just recently, GLAD um, put out um, a, a new uh, grading of, of internet, it's mostly social media sites around how they deal with information about uh, LGBTQ plus uh, people. Mostly they got all Fs, uh, which I think is probably a fair grade uh, for most of them. Um, but one of the things she was talking about was now that they're, they're, they're putting out bad information about uh, uh, AIDS drugs and things like that are ways to, uh, to the different different treatments that you can do to prevent AIDS uh, before it happens at, after after it possibly happens and it was just a wash a lot of these sites were a wash in that kind of information and so I I I, I kind of I, when as I'm looking you know I'm not talking a lot about my personal life but one of the things I've watched is how 
freeing uh, it's been for someone like me or and many others to find and locate people and feel good about yourself and see positive imagery throughout the media including on the internet at the same time see these same tools being weaponized um, by others and I, I think about that a lot in my coverage in my own life uh, and everything else is that the that you see an upward trajectory of things and at the same time it's constantly pulled back by the forces of um, of, of uh, homophobia and other other things that continue to persist and live in sort of the nether regions of the internet. At the same time, they've sort of they're not even living in the nether regions. They're out in plain sight, um, doing what they're doing, and that's what's even more terrifying. Is they never they used to sort of hide and skulk and and show up, you know, unless you're the Westboro Baptist Church, show up at funerals of people, which is just the most appalling thing I can think of. But they they certainly have tools now, and so I think we all have to, even though. I've kind of lived my life out. I've lived a life that's very uh, full and rich. Again, a lot of children, a lot of, you know, uh, trying to be examples to people. At the same time, we have to be ever vigilant um, moving forward because it's really hard um, not to imagine as you watch uh, legislation and things like that for all the things we've gone forward. Um, it's important that you continue and leadership continues to speak out about it. It's probably an incredibly tiresome um, uh, thing to do, uh, but leaders of companies like Cisco, leaders of all the big tech companies that I cover really have to be more explicit about these issues and not just do it every year at Pride um, and make it not just stack rank issues. And I know it's exhausting because there's so many social issues happening now and companies have to respond, but it's almost impossible given the way our societies evolve not to at least have some sort of baseline ability for people to actually bring themselves to work, um, which I think you talked about earlier. Um, I have always been able to bring myself to work um, in lot in all the facets it has, but you know, you see some of these movements of people not being able to talk at work about issues and the excuses being used that you're not being productive or this and that. Um, and I think it's really very hard now, especially um, how uh, partisan our society has become, how how um, political it's become, not to sort of draw the line at certain issues, including you know the dignity of uh, of of LGBTQ people and other and others because they're all related and systemically related, and so um, one of the, the things that I've seen evolve is huge amounts of progress, but at the same time more dangerous uh, challenges uh, to to gays and lesbians uh, across the world, and we have to constantly keep that in mind as we celebrate and dance all over the place and do everything else um, because even though we've moved forward. Uh, it's it's a very easy it's very easy to move backwards or become complacent. Um, and so one of the things I try to do in my life is not to do that, to be thinking, you know, um, um, to be thinking really hard about the possible challenges as as we see lots of these technologies roll out. Every single technology could be a real boon to the world, but at the same time, um, cause real problems. And so I'm always vigilant. Um, I am I'm very grateful as a uh, uh, to be able to have the family I have and to live in the society I do at this moment, um, even with all its problems. Um, and I couldn't have imagined, you know, 20, well, maybe I could have, I actually did. I thought I was going to have kids, so I guess I could have imagined. Um, but the changes, um, it's easy to forget uh, what we allowed, uh, how we allowed to sort of edit our lives, and now we don't have to. And so I urge leaders to be very um, much more open to disagreement at work in ways that are productive um, and causing causing civil discussions between people and not let it degenerate into one giant Twitter fight with each other, but to really have thoughtful discussions and disagreements with all kinds of people so that everybody feels heard. And at the same time, the direction is always towards more tolerance, more diversity uh, and more uh, openness. Okay. Okay, who do I go to now? We start the discussion. Let's let me say. Um, so, uh, so I guess we're going to start with the panel participants. Is that correct? That would be great. Okay. Yes, Kara. Thanks. You're in okay, charge. No problem. <laughs> oh, I am. Okay. <laughs> You're going to regret that one. Well, um, okay. Uh, okay. So we have. Uh, let me make sure I have this correct. We have Molly right now. Correct. Let me you, yes. you all changed it because this this one doesn't say that. So we have um, this is Cisco's out LGBTQ plus senior leaders, Rachel Barger, senior vice president. Uh, Jeff is not here. Correct. Molly is here. Molly's here. And then uh, Steve, uh, is it Vig Vigna? Is it vice Vigna? Vigna. Vigna. 
Beignet. Oh, it's fancy French. Okay, good. Um, so why don't I love it to have each of you uh, sort of describe your you know journey to leadership and the strategies um, as a as a as a you know it, it, with your identity as a gay and less LGBTQ person. Why don't we start with you, Molly? Thanks, Kara. So uh, first of all, happy to be here. And yeah, I'm stepping in for Jeff um, as he's in DC with Chuck working on an announcement, which is really exciting. Um, I would just say that my journey has um, been very nonlinear in my career. I've been in tech for almost, um, for a little over 20 years. Uh, and it has never been like, you know, very defined uh, in terms of my growth pattern. What I tend to lean into is, you know, where I'm the most curious, what I want to learn next, and then I kind of go for it. But I think part of my being a part of the LGBTQ plus community is in how that impacts my career is that I actually really didn't know what the playbook was to navigate my career. And I didn't exactly know, you know, I didn't exactly see people like myself in roles at the time that I might want to be in. And so as a result, I think my, you know, in addition to my wanting to learn, my career has taken a really nonlinear path. But at the end of the day, the through line is I'm never bored. I'm always learning. I'm always curious. And uh, in that, that's growth for me. All right, uh, Steve. Yeah, sure. Um, so just quick resume and then context around that as, as a gay man. So I've been in the tech industry and finance for almost 28 years, uh, the first 20 years at Intel and the last eight years at Cisco. And, and as a gay man, I hid the first 10 years of my career. Um, so I was extremely career focused. Um, Intel has a very strong culture, uh, still do today. Um, so very aggressive in terms of career development and advancement. And that was, I was laser focused on that for 10 years. And I had a belief, a personal belief that being out might impact that. So it was a choice that I made, not that Cisco was an oppressive culture in any way, but it was a choice I made to hide. Uh, and then slowly over time, I started to come out to friends, coworkers, managers, um, and, and it went fairly well. Um, I did have one setback, which was kind of interesting. And I look back on that as kind of a defining moment. I was, I was part of the LGBTQ plus organization at Intel and a contingent was going to out and equal in Washington, DC. And this was probably about 15 years ago now. And so I was one of about a dozen people that went. Upon returning, the group came to me and said, hey, you were the senior person at the event. Would you please write an article about the experience and have it posted to the Cisco circuit internal communication to 75,000 employees? I took a big gulp and said, okay, I can do this. And then I happened to be discussing with my boss at the time and her feedback to me was, Steve, do you want to be known for your work or for that? And it was, it was a real smack in the face. And unfortunately, again, 15 years ago, I kind of cowered to that pressure from my boss and I didn't write the article. And I feel bad about it to this day. Um, it was a missed opportunity to be an out leader. Um, and I, I think it, it's, I was basically, encouraged to go back in the closet by my boss at the time and and that comes from a lot of things that your boss has your compensation your promotions in their hands and so there was that fear factor that was kind of reinforced um so anyway i worked my way through that i continue to be active in the group and and since then things have been amazing so i i am totally out and at cisco i've been completely out and been completely embraced by day one frank calderoni in the interview process um kelly kramer a prior cfo and brian who's on the line now have been completely supportive of just accepting everyone for who they are so it's been a great experience so far steve did that did that hiding cause negativity towards your work i mean because a lot of people feel i know a lot of gays and lesbians who i think weren't as good at work because um they aren't break they aren't being honest because you're not a, you're not gen that you're genuine it's not incessantly talking about your personal life necessarily right. but everybody else does as a matter of course right oh i had my kids are driving me crazy or this and that or my wife husband and this and that yeah i mean i think what it i was so career focused i mean that was really my priority unfortunately but i was very laser focused on that but i think what it does is it limits you from getting closer connection to your peers, your managers, yeah. and, and therefore a stronger connection to the company. Because you feel welcome. You feel like you want to do great things for the company if you're accepted as who you are. If you're hiding who you are, 
there's a lot of missed opportunities in having that connection to other individuals, which endears yourself more to the company. So that for me, that's what I felt. As I came out, I felt significantly more connected and wanting to do great things for the company because they accepted me for who I was. Okay, great. Rachel? So I think my story is a lot like Steve. I, I didn't come out until I was in my sort of early 30s. And I was just like you, Steve. I was hyper-focused on my career. And, and I also felt, you know, being a female in technology, I sort of had to work through that aspect of being the only in so many settings. Plus, you know, Kara, as you said, you know, I didn't feel comfortable going, you know, talking to people about my weekend. Like you, you got this weirdness factor about yourself. Like people, oh, what did you do this weekend? Uh, well, I, you know, because you just didn't feel comfortable saying I was hanging out with my partner or we, you know, the things that we were doing. And it, and, you know, I really do feel I, I progressed well, but in leadership, I think that's when it really hits home. Like you've, you have to be your whole self and your full self to your team and your authentic self for them to buy into what you're asking them to do and for you to really create those connections. And it was actually, you know, my spouse, um, she's Australian. And I met her in 2008 when I got, I feel so lucky that I got sent in, on an assignment to Australia, met her. And then as part of my career journey, I was asked to move back to the U.S., and this was before gay marriage. And I that actually was the forcing function to me. And that's why legislation is so important because there are all of these people that have families like mine that are, you know, multi-country families. You know, Mark, you, know, you, you have similar, you know, things that you work through. So many of us do. And I had no pathway to get back because my partner, Linda, you know, she she didn't have a green card. You know, I, I couldn't even really bring her over. And so we took the biggest chance of our lives. We crossed our fingers and hoped that the Supreme Court would get it right. And and we moved. And I actually, believe it or not, you know, I sort of am higher on the risk tolerance, uh, you know, aspect. We bought a house in D.C. and we moved. And, and that actually made me speak to my boss. And it was such a funny situation. I was sure it was going to change our relationship. And he was so welcoming to me. And he embraced Linda as part of his own family. And, and it was just such an opening. It just was such an opening experience for me. And I don't want to pretend like it's this fairy tale because there were a lot of really difficult aspects along the way. But, you know, and everybody has to make their own choice about when they come out and when they, they have these discussions. But it was a real positive for me. But, you know, most of my career has been in Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa, in Europe. And I think it is something that, you know, as part of my leadership journey, how do I continue to connect with people that have, you know, various cultural beliefs? You know, how do I work with my team in Indonesia and, um, and, and continue to be myself, help them to understand I am who I am, help them to understand, you know, I am a good person. I'm here for them. I'm here to help them, but also understand when I'm meeting with customers or when I'm doing various things, if I'm in Kuwait, if I'm in Oman, you know, I'm, I'm going to act a little bit differently. And I think that's the aspect that all of us have to continue to work with. And, and again, why legislation and, um, and working through that and, and being on the forefront of it is so very important. So let's talk about that idea of self-editing, because I do think it's a, a negative thing. You know, I have been out since forever because right. um, it was exhausting to lie. I, I actually, but the one point in my life when I wasn't was I wanted to join the military. Uh, my dad was in the military and it was, you know, uh, don't ask, don't tell. And by the way, it's not just Republicans. That was a whole, that was a Bill Clinton special, right? Um, and I wanted to ask, I wanted to tell. It was like, this is ridiculous, but I really very much wanted to serve in the military and didn't, wasn't able to. Um, uh, and also I was thinking about joining, you know, the CIA and it just was hard. It was hard at the time back then, um, less hard now, but still an issue for sure. And so one of the things I remember thinking about is that when that couldn't happen at the moment, um, actually you just get kicked out because I would tell, um, was the self-editing function. And so one of the things I've tried to do is not edit, not, and, and you were just talking about when you're in Kuwait or things like that. And I'm thinking of a, a time when I was with, uh, you know, it was it was interesting because when you look at things that are positive and what are negative, like often, and it's always VCs. I'm sorry to say, um, you know, they'll I'll be at a party and they're like, "That girl, Kara, don't you think that girl is pretty?" And I'm like, "Still a feminist, still a feminist." Like you have to like, it, it's like, I just I can't. No, I'm not a guy. Thank you for that. You know, and I'm not a piggish guy like yourself because most men. Most men are very lovely, most men, not all. Um, and so uh, so talk each of you about self-editing. I'd love to hear um, uh, from each of you about that. Why don't, 
Why don't we start with you, uh, uh, M Molly? Yeah, I mean, I think um, what I didn't mention earlier is that, you know, I, it took me, I would say, until I was in my mid-30s to come out. And it's because I just frankly didn't feel safe from a career perspective to be able to do so and like mm -hmm. sure that my career would be compromised for it. And so all the while, um, up until then, I had been self-editing. And it's like, number one, that's cognitive load. Number two, like, to your point, Kara, you just suck at work when you're self-editing, for lack of better words. Um, mm -hmm. And the minute I came out, even to like two or three people, was like the minute I just started landing more and more wins. And like, there is a business case to like being out. Um, but I'll just say that like, being able to be out and relieve myself of self-editing meant it's it's kind of like this act of unapologetic and wild self-care. It's like this is making me sick. This is creating anguish. This is hard. And this is like not just like affecting my ability to like drive like some really great wins at work, but it's also just I don't feel well. And um for me, that was kind of like this turning point where one, I'm gonna stop doing it. Two, I actually felt like I needed a really big change in my life in order to actually stop self-editing. So I actually left Cisco. And this is my second rodeo back at Cisco. And I left Cisco for two years, um, Not went, didn't go too far, I went to NetApp. And I decided, you know, listen, I'm just gonna be on, I'm just gonna be like who I am. And it was fantastic. And the minute I decided to come back to Cisco was when I decided, you know, in every single interview conversation, I'm gonna make sure before I even get the job that I employ some aspect of reverse interviewing and come out myself um, and see if like, you know, that hiring manager's head explodes because if it does, this is not the right role for me. Um, and I've just been, I've managed to be just delighted every single time about how um, immaterial my identity is to the job, which is awesome. But that's, yeah, that's my story on self-editing kind of my journey. Steve? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think most of us talk about self-editing, hiding who you are and what you did on the weekends. It, it's not fun uh, and, and it is exhausting over time. And, and the big one for me is, as I said, I think it holds you back from being connected to your coworkers, your managers and your peers. And, and you're you're being robbed of the depth of those relationships and how positive that can be. Um, and, and a couple examples that I'll share, this is kind of the benefits of not self-editing. Um, my business partner is Jonathan Davidson, an ELT member, and he's aware of, of my my husband and Javino. And we I was in a meeting with him in this past year. And I, my voice was horrible. And he's like, oh my God, Steve, you sound like Batman. I am Batman. I mean, I sounded horrible. He's like, wrong. And I shared with him the prior night, my husband and I had to make the very painful decision to pull the plug on his prior partner, um, who was gravely ill and on life support. And I was, a, I was a wreck. And Jonathan recognized that. He knew what was, I was able to share that with him. And the next day, flowers showed up at the house addressed to my partner and I, or my husband and I, from Jonathan. That was amazing. I mean, that is an example of not self-editing and just saying, oh, I had a bad night and have Jonathan thinking, oh, my finance guy is off today and not doing a good job versus me being able to be truthful. He understood what was happening and it strengthened our relationship and it turned into this kind of beautiful thing that I knew I had, Jonathan had my back and he cared about me as an individual. So that's the benefit of not self-editing. And, and the other quick one more on a lighter side, Brian Maddox, who's on the call, he's, he knows my, my partner Javino well, and we all ride Zwift, which is a cycling simulation tool. And Brian's always asked me, how's Javino doing? Is he caught up to me on Zwift? Because you have different levels that you ride. So it's another connection point to my boss. Because I'm not self-editing, um, it just creates this, again, kind of this trust and therefore this commitment to Cisco because I don't have to self-edit. So that's the positive of not self-editing that, that I've experienced. Rachel? Yeah, I think 100% um, self-editing, when I stopped self-editing, I became a better leader, I was happier in all of those aspects. But I also think there's a, a, an aspect of owning your power, right? And also, you know, where are you comfortable with, with your journey and what you're doing? And I think there, there have been times, I'll be completely honest, that I did not feel safe in a particular country I was in or in a particular situation that I was in um, being my true self. My rule personally is within my company, I am, I am me, 
right? There's no apologies. I am me. And I think it's so important because I want everybody to know I'm your sister. I'm your, your cousin. I'm your neighbor. You know, this is, you know, I, it's not that in so many areas that I've worked in the past, people might not have ever think that they've interacted with somebody that's LGBTQ, right? But by being me, they have that experience and they can equate that with me and, and, and get a better understanding. But because I'm on the sales function, I'm also responsible for helping my teams to you know, execute transactions. And I'm, I'm never, you know, what I try to do is if people ask me about my, my life, I'll say my partner right? Or my spouse or things like that. And, and if I get a sense that they're open, then I'll talk more. But I'm also, I do try to be, I, I, I try to look at it as to what am I trying to accomplish out of this? And is that person even going to be open and in a headspace that they can even understand and, and just trying to understand that balance. But, it, you know, I completely agree with you with all the panelists is something that we have to work with all the time. And to Mark's earlier point, it's a, it's, it's something that you have to make decisions about. You know, people can't look at you and just make a determination. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've always found that being out just it's the only way to go. You know, even even in I understand of unsafe places, and there is there are you know we live in this country where we where there's a possibility of violence, but not as is in other countries where there's the probability of violence in certain countries for sure, and especially around the leadership. So let's talk about that that idea of leadership. You know, the the you were talking about legislation and things like that. How do you assess the current sort of atmosphere for uh, LGBTQ plus people? Because one of the, you know, on one hand, again, there's been all, like, there's just a poll out showing 70% of Republicans now agree that gay people should be able to get married, which is much higher than it's ever been, I guess, although the 30% is just still sitting there. Um, and it reminds me of a, a, a relative of mine um, who way back when, when gay marriage was first starting, and by the way, gay marriage isn't the only issue here. It's just one of the many. Um, he said, uh, Kara, I, I, uh, I just want you to know, you know, 50% of America doesn't believe in gay marriage. You know, he was trying to make that argument. He's a very religious person. And I said, well, how did you lose that 49% so quickly? And he was sort of like, what? And I said, it used to be 99%. And now it's 50 and then it'll be 30 and 20. And then it's just you and your bunch of jackass friends who really are part of the past. And he didn't appreciate it particularly, but I was actually correct. I sent him the, the story actually still living. And I said, once again, losing, as I predicted. Um, and so I just want sort of when you look around the country, I'd love you to sort of reflect on. What is heartening to you and what scares you about what's happening, especially to me, the attack on uh, the trans community are particularly vehement right now, but it's just because it's easy to to create the narrative around, you know, girls playing sports, protecting girls playing sports. They're trying to go for the sort of the soft underbelly where they can make attacks and narratives that are somewhat plausible of which they are not, but they not nonetheless work for a lot of people. So um, Steve, why don't we start with you? What do you, what are you heartened by and what are you, what are you worried about? Well, I think to the point you were just making, Carrie, we, there's been a lot of progress. So I'm, I'm heartened by that gay marriage. I mean, it's amazing. Um, my partner and I got married during COVID. We did a COVID wedding. Um, we've, been, we've been together for 10 years, but we went to window number four at Riverside County during, during COVID. Um, so that was our wedding ceremony. Um, so that's, that's heartening, I, I, I think. Um, but I will say, just going back six months prior administration, I was concerned. To the point that you were making in the beginning, Kara, that could that be taken away? Could that right be taken away? It, it's pretty scary to think that there was a lot of discussion and rhetoric going on about gay marriage under the prior administration. Right. Or go back to the states, or go back to the states at right. the way abortion is happening, it, exactly. or restrictions, et cetera. Right. So, so I think that's what I would say is the most disheartening is we make all this progress, but then very quickly that can be challenged. And so there is still is uncertainty out there, but I like to look at it in positive half class fall. I, I am heartened by most uh, that's going on. I mean, obviously there are big issues in, in trans and other other issues that are, that are horrible. We have tons of progress that we need to continue to make, but that's the thing that's been the most disheartening to me over the last year or so is just this kind of uncertainty, make progress and then can it be taken away again. Molly? And I'll say from a global perspective, this is where I, I find, especially as a leader, this gets really challenging. The reality is that there is no baseline. 
And that's really hard. And everyone across the world, Rachel mentioned Indonesia as a great example. You mentioned Hungary, Kara. Um, there's just ongoing examples of um, challenges across the world with our employees. We have employees in every single one of these countries. And the legislation and, you know, whether it's at a local level or a country level, or even just the kind of unwritten quote unquote legislation that's just from a very kind of cultural context, like just makes things really hard and it really impacts um, the livelihood of folks in those areas. And so I think like there is stuff like that's definitely happening in the States and we have to take care. Um, we have to participate as much as we can in legislation because for sure it's going to impact the folks we work with. But this is what's hard for me is being able to manage the global nuance, the cultural nuance that like, and there's no consistent, uh, there's no consistent experience here. Rachel? I echo everything that uh, that Steve and Molly said, and I think that's one of the things that where I think it's so important to have allies because it's always, unfortunately, it's whoever yells the loudest in some, you know, sometimes. And it's um, and unless we're all banding together and yelling loud and talking about why this is so important, it can get lost and and other voices can come through and, you know, I. I completely agree, and I think it, it's also our opportunity as um, organizations to band together. There are things like um, health insurance. How do we make sure in every country that people's you know, domestic partners and spouses and, and partners that are not married have health insurance? You know, I just very, very recently ran into a situation. I was living in Singapore, and again, I, I could not get um, a, a domestic pass for my partner. So I had to leave Singapore because they did not recognize same-sex marriage. And there are all these aspects, uh, or even you know, same-sex domestic partnerships, there's all these aspects that we need to be loud and understand because they are they're practicalities for, for people within your organizations. They're practicalities for your friends, for your neighbors. And it's actually just bad business too. I mean, th those are the, the other aspects that we can really lean in on. And the more that we can be active, understand the great you know, progress that we've made, but then we've got to be active and, and try to push further on the progress spectrum so that we don't continue to get drug back. Well, how, how much, I'm going to start with you, Rachel, how much should companies get involved? There's this sort of push across some companies in Silicon Valley to like, don't bring your, wait, wait, bring yourselves to work, but don't bring yourselves to work, you know, and in fact, you're very noisy and you're, 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 you know, you're ruining my uh, keto jam, you know, uh, whatever, whatever jam these guys happen to be in. But one of the things that's disheartening is that here you have, you know, ideas that you're going to push on diversity, you know, at least words that you're going to do so and saying, having, you know, saying so in CEO speeches and then very little progress being made in diversity, which the numbers are the numbers, um, especially uh, people of color and women um, in tech, at least, uh, and across the country, really. Um, and then to have people say, and now the one thing you could do before was talk, you know, whether it's Google or wherever, there were memes, there were boards, there were meetings with the CEOs over drinks on Friday, whatever. Now you can't talk. How does that? What do you? What, how do you look at that? Should what should man? How should management deal with the fact that, you know, some issues bringing yourself to work is critical, right? Whether it's uh, Asian American violence against Asian Americans, whether it's uh, George Floyd, whether it's uh, you know the tra attacks on trans. How do you? How do you look at that? Each of you, um, when you have these things happening, what should leadership do? Because on one hand, sure, you want to be productive. And the other, some of these issues are quite critical to people's lives. Yeah, personally, I'm really proud to be at Cisco. That's actually one of the key things that I just joined Cisco in October. Um, it's one of the key reasons that I joined is because I felt like we had a, a you know, from all the way down, from our board down, everyone has a, a, the vast majority of all of our employees have a viewpoint that we need to be active and we need to use our power for good and we need to be heard. And, and so personally, I think it's incredibly important. And I think that's why I've made some of the decisions I have. Molly? Oops. I would, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I, I'm having actually some technical difficulties. Steve, can no I pass problem. over to you? Thank you. Oh, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with what Rachel said. I mean, Cisco has been incredible on the social issues over the last year. I mean, Kara, you, you probably are not aware of all that Cisco has done 
but the company check-ins that we've had with Chuck and the entire leadership team, mm -hmm. um, race issues, just, I mean, you name it, across the board, they have not shied away from a single one of these issues. Um, I also, I, I used to lead, I recently passed it off to, to themselves, but the African-American mentoring for finance, I used to lead that. And we had a lot of discussions about how amazing it was that Chuck was addressing these issues head on. So I think Cisco as a company has done an incredible job in terms of addressing these issues with their employee base um, and educating their employee base, having the tough discussions with their employee base. And then externally, I, I think we put our money where our mouth is in terms of putting dollars behind social justice issues. Um, I think we were one of the first or handful of first companies that were actually doing this. And even to the point that we were pissing off some investors that were mm -hmm. saying, why would Cisco go do this? And we basically said, tough, this is what we believe in. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think Cisco has really shown some guts in this space. Unfortunately, I think a lot of this change needs to be done legislatively. And I think that's harder to influence. Uh, I mean, not impossible, but it's harder for a company to influence. Do you, do you have any, do you put any um, stock in the idea of it getting too, you know, hot at work? I, I hear a lot of complaints from, I was just at something the other day and some, you know, I guess Slack, people were complaining about Slack and the people were mean to them. And I was like, suck it up. You haven't been gotten feedback forever. And now you're actually getting feedback, some of which is going to be stupid, some of which is very smart. Um, but I think powerful people should always suck it up, you know, when they're getting criticized. How do you, do you see it? But do you see any po like negatives in the ability of anybody to say anything at any time? From, from what I've seen, if you're directing that question to me, I mean, I, I've, I've seen the leadership team completely hold the line on this. Yeah. Uh, they're, yeah. they're taking a strong stand. They're having these tough conversations. And if, if we're getting flack back from the employee base, I think they've done a great job of educating people. Focusing mm -hmm. on it, and even to the point of there's a chat room that goes on in each of these mm -hmm. um, company meetings. Um, our HR partners basically even came up with a scale of dialogue. Hey, this is kind of you're getting in the red zone. If you're talking about these things, this is orange, this right. is yellow. I may be butchering the scale, but the point is they were educating the employee base how to have a productive conversation on these issues, which right. is amazing. Yeah, which is difficult when people are angry. Uh, Molly, yes. can you comment? Yeah, no, um, I, I would completely agree. I think the fact that we actually have social justice outcomes or actions um, that anyone, you know, in the industry can actually go to our website and check out like what we're actually doing, we're putting pen to paper, which I think is um, is really important because what that means for us is that we're driving a programmatic approach to for social justice um, based on a variety of dimensions, whether it's human rights, whether it's investing in H HBCUs, um, and so on. And I think that's that's really special that I haven't seen out of other organizations as much, to be honest. I will just say, like, what you're leaning on is allyship. And mm -hmm. there is this aspect of, um, you know, allyship, advocacy, accomplice, but regardless, just be fearless and relentless in your allyship. Do the work. Um, don't let, you know, don't make me enable you or, like, make don't, don't make me do the work for you. Just lean in and do the work. You're not going to get fired for it. Um, you're actually probably going to have better business outcomes if you do it. And uh, there is value in learning and asking them questions if you actually want to know more about our community. Um, I ask them questions all the time, and I'm a part of the community, and that's a form of my allyship as well. So that's kind of where my head goes. So talk a little bit about that, each of you, the ally. You know, what 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 is, what needs to happen? Does there have to be an industry-wide thing? Um, I was talking to... A, a pretty prominent CEO and he's like, oh, it's just like one issue after the next. It's really hard. Like, and sometimes we talk about splitting it up, like one person takes this one, one person takes that one. But how how can allies work together more effectively if that's the case? As Because it can't just be, you know, one company doing better while, I don't know, Facebook over here is not monitoring this kind of, you know, this, this AIDS medicine stuff they're not monitoring is really quite dangerous um, what's happening. Um, and so how do you, how do you affect others? And then how do you, what do you expect? How can allies work together? Uh, Rachel, why don't you go? Yeah, sure. I'll jump in. So I think it's, 
unfortunately, right now, I think a lot of it is grassroots, but I, I think all of us have friends in the industry. And that was one of the things, um, and I'll refer to Singapore again, a lot of the multinational corporations really banded together to try to push around some of the issues that we thought were incredibly important for our employees, mm -hmm. a wide variety of issues. And I think that when we do that, we don't all have to be in the same industry. In Singapore, we were actually, a lot of technology was banded together with a lot of financial services and, and things like that and, and some manufacturing. So I think the more we can take that step and make that outreach and to try to, to bring commonality across companies and try to do things together, it's incredibly important. And then I'd also say allyship within our own company is so important. There are so many people out there right now today that are you know maybe watching this, maybe they're not watching this, that, that maybe they haven't come out yet, or maybe they haven't felt comfortable yet. And by just taking that action and helping people to understand that you're an ally, by creating that space for that person to have that conversation, or by, by saying something in a conversation that shows that you're open to those kind of things, gives people confidence. And it's all about making people comfortable and making people comfortable that they can be their true self, no matter what it is, no matter what type of, of diversity or what type of, of um, thing that they wanna talk about, the more we get you know, better discussion happening, the better things are going to get for all of us. And so I just really ask for all of our allies. I try to do that for anyone in my teams, you know, whatever the diversity spectrum you're on. How can we make more open space for people? Uh, Steve? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think externally Rachel touched on most of it. I mean, I do think Chuck is a well-connected CEO. So I, I believe he is making a lot of connections that will create these ally relationships cross cross company borders. Um, so so I think he's demonstrating a lot of leadership there. And I think all of us as individuals have responsibility to do that as well. I still talk to poor prior colleagues at Intel um, and we share kind of what's going on there, what's going on here and try to try to get some best known methods going across companies, but that's more grassroots. Um, so I think that's kind of the external ally piece. And then internally, yeah, I mean, I think as my couple of things that I think are important for allies are as a manager of employees, I think you need to get to know your employees. You need to, if you ask and you create a kind of a safe environment where people can share, I, I think you'll be surprised how much people will share and you'll get to know your employees and that will create more allyship with your managers. And then as an individual, you have to be able, you have to share of yourself. Um, you have to be an open individual sharing who you are, all aspects of your life. And I think you'll find that people will seek you out if you do that as an ally. Um, mm -hmm. I can tell you as, as I've come out over the years at work, um, I've had a lot of people come to me just for one-on-one -on -one mentorship and then also other leaders in the organization. And these are kind of funny conversations like, yeah, Steve, you're gay. My son is gay. And this is kind of what he's doing. So it's created these kind of connections to people and, and, and therefore kind of creates this grassroots allyship just, be, just by being open and sharing of yourself and then trying to get to know other people. All right. Uh, Molly? Yeah, I would echo all these sentiments. I mean, I think that, you know, just... You know, here I am, gay woman of color with ADHD. Hi, I need <laughs> lots of help. And so I, I think like, you know, allyship is really just about being a good human being. Uh, Mark and I call it the don't be an a-hole platform. Um, but it really is just uh, all about like recognizing the humanity in all of us and um, showing up vulnerable. If you don't know how to be an ally, I think that's like, that's super important from a leader perspective. This is super important, especially because, you know, we're all working from home. What I noticed with my employees is that, you know, working from home for not in two months is one thing, working from home for 14 months, that's, that is a life change. That is life impacting. There are other allyship needs that come to the surface that I have to be aware of. And I also have to, you know, as middle management here um, on the call, like I have to make sure that my leadership is also aware of what's happening with my team and then at the same time being able to, to uh, represent voices that aren't represented in the room with my peers is something that can be exhausting but something that's just super important so it's like I need to advocate not just for you know one dimension myself but every dimension and also for the folks that are actually quite underrepresented so that represents our black Americans that represents our Native American and indigenous community represents you know our Latinx community so on and so forth and this is when we talk about 
allyship specific to um, BIPOC communities. It's definitely one where our focus is, but it certainly is not limited to it, especially as a leader. Yeah, it's important to imagine that this is all systemic because there are a lot of the same. The idea of separating people is really appealing to the enemies of change, essentially, in terms of not understanding they're all the same thing. The struggles, you know, different types of things, but they're all the same things. I think people don't. In you know, a lot of these, a lot of the stuff that we're having today, you don't understand the systemic nature of the, you know, even, you know, it's not just hate and information online. It's also addiction. It's also the need to use it all the time, which is what we've seen through the pandemic. I think that's really important to think about the systemic nature of all of it, that it's linked to other people rather than have, you know, keeping us separate is how power, bad power stays in power, which I think is the way it always works. Um, I'd like to finish up by, uh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, hey, Kara, thank you. Uh, yeah. We'd love to find, uh, just thinking about time management, finding our way yeah. to uh, a final question. We'd love some final Yeah, questions. I have my final question. I was, I was just Super. about to say that. Thank you, Mark. Super. Um, I, I, I'm watching the clock. Don't worry. Um, so the last thing I'd love you to, to end up on something, you know, even though I'm not uniformly positive, um, uh, in general, I always look for problems, but that's okay. That's a, that's a good function of someone because um, most often I'm right, uh, often, often about the things. Uh, uh, they, um, I, I want to think about something positive. What do you think is like a thing for it? I'm just, the reason I was looking over my phone is my son is getting, he like, I have tattoos and he's getting tattoos and he's thinking of having the tattoo mamas put on his, on himself, which made me laugh. It's either an eagle or mamas, you know, a big heart, but mamas, which I thought was really great. Um, and one of the things when I think about hope, I think about my kids, like, uh, ha them growing up and feeling that, that they are completely valued and at the same time don't have issues and it's not just because they grew up in san francisco or anything else but as they when i look at young people many many of them are so accepting and so like not it's just not an issue there's you don't carry around all this baggage we carried around and so if my son's going to put a tattoo on him it's going to last till the end of his life um declaring you know that he is gay parents lesbian parents um i think that's really kind of fantastic on some level um, of course, my ex-wife is like, no more tattoos. I'm like, yes, more tattoos. Um, so, but that's just normal parenting, like that people disagree. Um, so I feel good about that. I feel it makes me happy to think that he's going to do something like that. Um, and that's a small thing. It's a tiny thing, but it's really kind of great that he feels so confident and good about how he was raised and and stuff like that, that he can feel out himself, I guess, as a child, a child of uh, gays and lesbians. Anyway, each of you, uh, and then we'll finish up. I'll just start. Um, I think, like, uh, sorry, I, I just as like you know, one note of positivity is I'm dialing in here from my mom's house. Uh, um, my partner and I live in San Francisco, um, so you know that's just a fantastic place to be. But like, it's one thing when like you can actually bring your whole self to work, not just at work, but also in your family. And uh, this morning I woke up, I went upstairs, got my, my coffee. My mom's like, "Oh, aren't you wearing the old Cisco Pride T-shirt? Like, didn't you get a new one in the mail?" And then I was explaining why I was wearing it, and the fact that, that this is normalized in you know, my South Asian and immigrant household was just, it was awesome. And yeah. so that's kind of what I would want to start. Cool. Uh, Steve? Uh, yeah, I mean, mine, and I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid of Cisco here, is I, I really do believe Cisco is a safe space for people to be who they are and therefore have whatever career they want here, wherever their capabilities are going to take them. So whether it's LGBTQ plus or whatever organ group organization at Cisco, this is a great place. You can thrive. So I, I, I've been in a couple different companies, and I, I can say this one stands head and shoulders above most that I've seen. So that's pretty awesome that we get to work at this great place. All right, Rachel, you get the last word. Yeah, the same as everyone else. I mean, the amount of change that's happened in the last 10, 15 years is immense. And that just gives me hope that it provided we all stay vigilant on it. The amount of change 10, 15 years from now is, is just going to be mind-blowing for all of us. So um, so that's what I'm positive about. Okay, great. All right. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate the conversation. I got to go. I actually go and interview Anthony Fauci. So I got to get ready to do that. Um, all right. Thank you. I have a lot of questions for him. Um, okay. Thank you so much and have a great uh, pride. And uh, I appreciate the invitation. All right. Bye. Yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you as well. Um, I don't know about you all. I can't believe that just happened. This was a discussion that I don't think many of us will soon forget. Um, hey, I'm just going to jump in. Your audience is really chunky, uh, as I said. Yeah. 
So again, we're going to just do a, a, an audible here, <laughs> unless you can picture. Yeah, you're nodding. So hey, everyone. Uh, Molly's having technical issues. That's how life goes. Um, so listen, Kara Swisher. Uh, Molly and I were texting back and forth. Starstruck. Kara Swisher, amazing. Um, and we're going to pivot now to um, another conversation. But before we leave that, uh, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us today. Steve, thank you so much for joining us today, being your authentic selves. And um, I got messages in the background already from lots of different people, the inspiration that people are getting from this conversation, from all spectrums of our LG LGBTQ plus and allied community. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone publicly. Um, we're going to turn it over now to another amazing conversation with another amazing external guest, and I am so thrilled and pleased to introduce our executive leadership team sponsor, uh, Todd Nightingale, with his Nightingale sweater. Todd, to you. How's it going, Mark? I appreciate that. I got to tell you, when you told me that you were going to get Kara Swisher uh, to come on to this event, I was blown away. I, I probably listened to three podcasts regularly in my life and i almost never miss uh sweat I, I i'm blown i'm starstruck um uh, and we were we were uh on right before fauci i think that's pretty hilarious but steve and rachel and molly uh you guys stood up to kara swisher interviewing i mean that's uh, impressive uh that is impressive and um, I, I really am starstruck so i'm trying to hold it together here um i'm honored to get a chance to interview uh, our board member, uh, Dr. Christina Johnson, today. Um, uh, but before that, oh, hi, Christina. How's it going? Hi, Todd. Uh, Dr. Johnson, I should say. I'm sorry. I, uh, uh, I should be the most formal I can be here. Uh, but before before we do that, I uh, I was asked to do this. I I get asked this question a lot, uh, why I choose to be involved with Pride and why I've gotten more uh, involved as, as the ELT sponsor. Um, it, it, it is a good question and I, I do, I, it does come up quite a bit, I think, as like a white, cisgendered, straight male. I'm like the most boring person I know. Um, and I think um you know i've spent a lot of time thinking about that if for no other reason than i get asked it all the time and i and i i, I have some experience with the community my, my best friend is is gay and i've seen people struggle uh coming out of the closet both personally and and professionally and, so, and many times uh, in very different ways with very different uh concerns um and so in, in thinking about this i think what it what why why I'm, i've always been passionate about this I, I think what it really came down to was this you know in my career i've always relied sort of heavily on building teams i love teams i'm building camaraderie i'm building community and in doing that i've relied on bringing my whole self to work and i and for a long time i never thought twice about that um and having learned uh, more and more about the LGBTQ plus community and, um, you know, thanks even to folks on the call here, like Mark, who have helped me learn a lot over the last few years, you know, understanding what it's like to not be able to bring your whole self to work and not be able to rely on that. Um, you know, until we're all be able to bring our whole selves to work. We're not building the most inclusive community possible. It's both a business imperative and a moral one. And um, it's something, this idea of, of being able to support every single person to bring their whole self to work is so important. Um, and it's something I am passionate about and something I think our company depends on. Uh, and that's really why I think everyone should be an ally uh, to this community. We, we shouldn't be asking me why I'm an ally. We should be asking everyone why they aren't, um, but many people are. So maybe that's a bad question too. Anyway, um, thought I'd take the opportunity to try to answer that question. Um, with no further ado, I am I'm proud to announce, I'm proud to introduce Dr. Christina Johnson, president of Ohio State University, and most importantly, a member of Cisco's board of directors. Uh, she's an engineer, an innovator, and an entrepreneur with more than three decades of experience. 
Uh, during this time, she's founded and led several successful science and technology companies, served as the end undersecretary of energy at the US Department of Energy, held numerous leadership positions in universities across the nation. Uh, she's a pioneering engineer in micro displays and color polarizing technology. Um, her, and she's been recognized by the National Inventors Hall of Fame, as well as with a John Fritz Medal, which is incredibly impressive uh, for anyone who doesn't know uh, the John Fritz Medal. So please join me in uh, welcoming from our Cisco Pride community, uh, Dr. Christina Johnson. How do, you, how do you do? Hi, thanks, Todd. Thanks so much for <clears throat> the opportunity to be here today and, um, you know, be part of Cisco Pride and, you know, continuing to contribute to the great culture that Cisco has in place with regard to inclusivity, diversity, technology, leadership, all those things that, that we value. And I, I would like to also add my thanks to Mark Murphy and, and uh, Molly Das um, for putting this event together. And also the outstanding leadership of Chuck Robbins and all the, the uh, ELT. So it's a pleasure. Uh, great, yeah, we're so glad to have you. Um, would, would you like to share a little bit about your, your journey to leadership? Um, I sure, I'll make it uh, brief if, if I may, but, um, you know, I, I grew up in Colorado and uh, I think that's relevant a little bit for um, what we're talking about today, because actually before I went to college at, at Stanford, I had never um, known anyone that was gay. I mean, I'm sure I had a lot of folks that, that were in and around, but, you know, this is 1975, so it was um, fairly new. And um, so I went to Stanford undergraduate and graduate, spent eight years. And, uh, you know, it was really a, a coming of age in many ways. Um, got a PhD in electrical engineering, which I uh, love being an engineer. Um, I think it's the best discipline. Uh, and then uh, I did a postdoc in Ireland for a couple of years. I had a chance to be at Trinity College Dublin. So if anyone's ever been to Dublin, College Park, um, drink good coffee and, and Bewley's and, and uh, <clears throat> Guinness and other things at uh, St. James Gate. So it was really a blast. Um, came back to the University of Colorado Boulder, where I spent 14 years really building the academic career. And that's where we did most of the work around the 3D movies and color display technologies. Um, started a company when I was there called ColorLink, which later we sold to Real D. So if you've seen one of the three or 400 3D movies, that's 3D by Real D. That's the technology behind that, which is fun. Um, and then, you know, uh, had established a center, a cross-disciplinary research center. So that's one of the major themes that have changed during the 30, 40 years I've been in academia, is that uh, when I started out, it was like one research project, a few graduate students, and you're by yourself, to building a, a team, you know, a big team, big tent, get a lot of different uh, chemists, physicists, engineers working together. And uh, that was a real turning point in my career, is the ability to lead that and uh, get an opportunity to deal with uh, a lot of people from different disciplines and, and backgrounds. Um, from there, I went to be Dean of the Pratt School of Engineering at Duke, which was fabulous, and then Provost of Johns Hopkins, and then Todd, as you mentioned, the Undersecretary of Energy in the Department of Energy, which I have to say was the first time, you know, you go in and you get the interview for, this is a presidential appointment, right? Uh, consent by the Senate. And, uh, you know, you go through and you ask everything, and. At the end, they say, well, is there anything else you need to know? Like they want to know, do you smoke? Do you drink? All these things. You go, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah or no, 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 no. I mean, and then um, then they said, well, is there anything else? I said, well, uh, I'm gay. And they said, oh, that's awesome. I just say that was the first time that it was a bonus, right? It was the first time it was. And that was 2009. So uh, from that's there, a bonus, though. That's great. It That's was. Amazing. It was a bonus. It was really great. Um, and then, uh, so I was under Secretary of Energy. Uh, we had the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which, you know, clearly the infrastructure uh, bills and the Endless Frontier, now the Innovation and Competitiveness Act, um, are, are, I think, in, in part built on the success of seeing what you could do with, at the time, it was only $800 billion. I, but we had 36 billion of that to invest in energy efficiency, renewable energy, carbon capture and sequestration, nuclear energy. And um, it, it was a, a really invigorating time because we had to get out $36 billion in peer reviewed great projects within months. 
And so we just worked so hard. It was really awesome. The whole country came together, really. We had 2,000 interviewers from universities all over the country. And that was during the time that Steve Chu was Secretary of Energy and then Ernie Moniz came in afterwards. So that was part of what I worked with um, great people like Matt Rogers and the Recovery Act. Um, the portfolio was about 11 billion and it covered everything from renewable energy to Yucca Mountain. So it was um, a really large thing. I think the most important thing that we did when I was undersecretary was write the strategic technology energy plan, which was a step by step over 40 years of how we'd get to 83% reduction in greenhouse gases from 2005 level by 2050. And today, you know, I look back and sometimes give a talk and said, this was our plan. This is what we've done. Where were the successes? What policy helped us get there? What do we still need to do? So it's it's uh, it was really an important uh, opportunity. So uh, when I left the after the midterm elections, that position, I got really energized about what can we do to create um, be part of that roadmap and that plan. So I formed a company in hydropower because hydropower was on the roadmap, and we um, built that company. It's called Cube Hydro. I started in 2011, I uh, sold it um, a couple years ago, and we actually built enough clean uh, energy to power 150,000 homes. Um, so that was, that was, and we used machine learning in order to optimize the kind of resources and clean electricity we'd get out of the, the uh, turbines. So that was really kind of fun, but I really wanted to go back to academia. So I said I'd make this short, so I better cut to the chase. Anyway, um, I was a chancellor of the State University of New York, missed being on a single campus. And so uh, almost a year ago, about a year ago and a week, I was announced as the 16th president of The Ohio State University. And if you look over, uh, over my left shoulder, you'll see a diploma. That's actually my grandfather's diploma when he went here and graduated in 1896. Um, so it kind of comes full circle. and. Uh, I love being part of the academy. So um, it was during the time that, Cube, that I left the under Secretary of Energy position, started my own company that I got a call in 2012 from uh, none other than John Chambers asking if I'd become part of the board. And that was phenomenal, you know, to be part of such an incredible company and to be a member of the board. My, I'm still floating from that, that call, which was really uh, key. So that's how we got to today. Yeah, it's such an honor for us to have someone on the board who has so much public policy uh, experience as well as uh, is, is, is an engineer. Um, and I apologize if I wasn't clear uh, about you being the president of the Ohio State University. If I didn't get that right, I'm, yeah, I, yeah, that's on me. That's on me. No, it's great. Should be watching more football. Um, so, <laughs> look, we, we don't... Uh, we don't get to talk to too many board members uh, too often, and we are getting proximate to our LGBTQ plus leaders. Um, what's it like? What What are your responsibilities on the board? What's it like being on Cisco's board? Well, it, it's it's been a phenomenal uh, nine years, and part of what board members do, of course, the most important thing that, that a board will do is is hire the the CEO. And so, we were part of um, the uh, team that you know hired. Uh, yeah, Chuck was great, obviously doing fantastically, and as a successor to John. So that's one of the important, most important things. And it's to provide, you know, advice, uh, judgment, um, oversight for big acquisitions. And so really be there in terms of background and leadership and finance and governance, um, diversity, uh, sales, marketing. Uh, my role in particular, uh, I look at R&D. And I think about um, how are we uh, developing talent? We have a fantastic, as you all know, head of, of our uh, chief people's officer with, with Fran uh, Kasutis. And we just um, couldn't be happier with really all the things that, that she is doing and, and bringing. Um, I've had the opportunity to look at some of the innovative work that's being done both on the technology side that connects people um, as well as what we're doing to develop people. So I think those are some of the things that we all have a series of skills. It's like a matrix. And so I try to bring that perspective from government, industry, academia uh, to the board. So that's, I think. Oh, awesome. Um, so we, we, we were 
uh, really, I think, lucky to have Kara a Swisher here and, and talk to the team about bringing uh, our whole selves to work. Um, what advice do you have for the for community members and how to bring their whole selves to work and, and the, you know, maybe the challenges uh, that that might that that might pose? Yeah, I was listening to the, to the, um, the uh, discussion. It was uh, fascinating and I think uh, exactly right on. I mean, you have to be able to bring your whole person to work, right? Because you can't be someone different at home than you are at work or else you're not giving 100% to the company, right? So, and that means the company has to create the culture that is welcoming and inclusive, which it, ha which it has. And I know you all know this, that Cisco is one of the top places in the entire world to work and it gets, you know, 100 out of 100 points um in terms of diversity and in inclusion and you know it's very similar to the ohio state university um we're one of the best of the best places for lgbtqa um plus places to go to college and five out of five from campus pride so i think i've been very lucky to be associated with both cultures that that value and understand the value of of um you know diversity so i think that's um I, I thought that was exactly right. And if you start to self edit part of your brain, it's not like there's this little part of your brain, which is, you know, the LGBTQA part of your brain and all the rest of the brain doesn't connect. It all connects. So when you shut down one part of your brain, you shut down that, um, you know, important parts of it. And, you uh -huh. know, I, I have to say one thing that I'll, um, is uh, when I was announced here, um, it really, I think someone in the last panel talked about the enormous change that's been made over the last 15 years, without a doubt. Um, being able to have uh, marriage equality is huge. And it's, it, you know, probably without it, it'd be difficult for me to have been appointed in this position, uh, honestly. And I think that, um, you know, I, I give a lot of credit to the Ohio State University and the trustees and the search committee because it really, you know, was, um, Everybody, the community has been so welcoming and so supportive and has really, uh, is, it's been a terrific transition. That, yeah, that is amazing. Well, why do you think the, uh, why do you think marriage equality was required to make that happen? How are those? Well, you know, required, I mean, certainly I'm not the first, um, uh, uh, out LGBTQA um, leader. You know, uh, but I think that there's a, a level of um, acceptance that, well, you know, there you, you take away that last sort of maybe excuse. Oh, well, it's not legal, you know, or it's this or that. It's just um, it was really empowering. I mean, I was actually living in, in Washington, D.C. because I started the company um, in uh, D.C. And I remember that night in, in uh, June 2015. I mean, I remember the day because I was taking a call outside the metro because I used to commute by, uh, by metro and everybody driving by honking horns. And I'm like, OK, Supreme Court must have made a little announcement this Friday. And then that night, the buzz all around town was, oh, we have to go to the Capitol. So I or, I mean, excuse me, the White House. So I text a friend of mine who works in the White House and I said, hey, Will, what's going on at the White House? Oh, well, we we lit it up. And I said, well, what do you mean you lit it up? And I said, come on, you got to get down here. So it was phenomenal. I mean, everybody was there. And I mean, as we know now, even Michelle Obama slipped out. And and uh, at least uh, some of the kids were there too. Um, you know, there were families and partners and everybody's just celebrating. It was such a great day. And I think that it, it, it um, really put to bed some of the legitimacy issues. From my perspective, yeah, I, really, I think that that's awesome. Uh, that's a great story too. I wish I was there. <laughs> um, I know we're short on time, Mark, but I do. I just want to get one last question in. Um, what uh, what ask might you have for the allies at Cisco uh, <coughs> enable to to enable you know more LGBTQ plus colleagues to bring their whole selves to work? Well, and I think continue to do the things that the the Cisco allies do. I mean, I mean, one of the things that was really special for me coming on the board. And I was listening again to the last conversation about self editing. Um, I've served on six publicly traded boards over the course of the last 20 years. And uh, there'll be board dinners and bring your, your spouses or your partners. And when I, I was single at the time that I joined the Cisco board, uh, but I met someone special who is now my wife, Veronica. 
And I had just met her. In fact, only a month earlier, as it turns out. But I thought she was pretty special. And so when when John was uh, CEO at the time, he said, well, you know, you need to uh, you, you should bring somebody, Christina. And uh, but, you know, it's it's partners and spouses. And and I said, well, John, when I have a partner, I, I'd be glad to do that. So a month goes by. I meet Veronica. So I RSVP for both of us. And he was so welcoming, literally, you know, just leaped across the lawn to, to welcome myself and Veronica. And then he asked me the key question. How long have you known each other? <laughs> and so I had to kind of say, well, you know, less than a year. And that became our standard joke. Uh, less than a year. Um, John Chambers married us. And I think that's the example of how our allies can continue to support. Um, we got married in Washington, D.C. at the uh, Museum for Women in the Arts. And John and Elaine came and he was the minister and he was uh, uh, fabulous as he always been. And so I think that continue to build that inclusive culture, uh, continue to ask about our spouses and our partners and our families, uh, show your visible support and um, call out bigotry of all kind. Just continue doing what we do. So that's what I would say, Todd. Wow, that is an amazing call to action. And uh, John Chambers married you. That's that is amazing. I, I I won't try to add anything to that. I thought that was that's an amazing call to action. I'll just thank you so much uh, for joining us. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to the host. So. Uh, thank you, everybody, and uh, I'm super excited again to help us power an inclusive uh, future for all. So thank you. Thank you, Todd and Dr. Johnson, Kara. Great conversation. I think we're all a little starstruck. Hey, everyone. Happy Pride. My name is Selma Lang. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm proud and excited to step into the global lead role now with my amazing co-lead, uh, Jennifer Wrightup. Before we close, I'll be brief, but I'll touch on what's next for Pride at Cisco and some actions that you can take. First, we wanna recognize that it has been a difficult year for LGBTQ plus folks around the world and, and maybe especially in your region. We truly empathize with everyone who struggled and may continue to struggle. Looking ahead, you can expect a focus from Pride on intersectionality and exploring how our queer identities are intertwined with and impact the other parts that make us who we are. As we always have, we'll look to the community to lead us to the conversations we need to have so that we can in turn lead our allies in their journey to create a Cisco where we can all feel safe, welcome, and free to be ourselves. Quick actions for everyone out there in terms of what you can do. Speak up, listen and learn, and donate and support important causes. The last thing I want to say is, of course, thank you. Dr. Johnson and Kara Swisher, thank you for joining us and leading us through the conversations today. To our Cisco leaders for sharing so openly and genuinely and generosity. Thank you to our Cisco Pride executive sponsors, Todd Nightingale and Brian Maddock, and our executive advisors, Beth Malati, Melinda Whitney Cox, and Norm DePoe and all our other sponsors in the regions and the chapters. To the many people who helped make today happen, a huge thank you to all of you behind the scenes and a special heartfelt thank you to our outgoing global leads for their dedication, support and leadership over the last two years. Last but not least, all of you out there appreciate you spending time with us to recognize Pride Month at Cisco. Thank you all for joining. down and just proud as heck that we've all kind of come together and 
This is her legacy. Between a family's loss and the fight for a cure, there's Casey Shemansky. If we're to build a bridge to an inclusive future, then getting healthcare to everyone, everywhere, 